Okay, so. <coughs> More massive stars spend less time on the main sequence. So consider a star cluster, a bunch of brothers and sisters, they're all born at the same time. It's a litter, if you will, uh, where there's, there's typically a few hundred, maybe even a few thousand puppies, so to speak. But it's all a litter of stars, all born at the same time. So if you plotted that, if you plotted an HR diagram for the cluster when it was very young, it would contain an entire main sequence. But over time, the highest mass stars move off the main sequence because they don't spend very long on the main sequence. So uh, zero age main sequence would mean when all the stars have just reached the main sequence. Now it turns out they don't all hit the main sequence at exactly the same time. But the time it takes a star to form is very small compared to the time it takes a star to burn through all its field on the main sequence. So when the cluster is young, you get pretty much a complete main sequence. Come back four million years later, and the upper part of the main sequence is missing because those most massive stars live less than four million years. And so they've already on the main sequence, so they've already left the main sequence. Come back in 10 million years, and some additional stars have already left the main sequence. Come back in 100 million years, even more stars have left the main sequence. So how much of the main sequence is left is directly related to how old the cluster is. The older the cluster is, the greater the fraction of stars at the upper high mass end of the main sequence that have already left the main sequence. And in order to figure out how old the cluster is, then the trick is you say, okay, where's the turnoff point on the main sequence? Where is it that stars are just leaving the main sequence? And then you consult your stellar models. For a star of that spectral type, it spends how many years on the main sequence? That tells you the age of the cluster. The main sequence lifetime of stars at the turnoff point is how old the cluster is. Because those are stars which are just now leaving the main sequence. So if your computer tells you how long it takes such a star to leave the main sequence, that tells you how old the cluster is. So the older the cluster is, the less of the main sequence it still has on it. Yes? And how is that, it talks about comparing that with different, both the different types of clusters? Yeah, so um, there are two, <coughs> excuse me, there are two major types of star clusters. There are open clusters and globular clusters. And studies of them show that when it comes to open clusters, we find a wide range of ages. Open clusters go from very old, billions of years old, to very young, uh, only a few million years old. And again, astronomers get to say only a few million years because we deal often in time scales of, that are thousands of times longer than that, billions of years. When we look at globular clusters, <coughs> almost all of them are very old. They're all billions of years old. As far as we can tell, there aren't any globular clusters forming today, whereas open clusters, we see open clusters forming before our eyes with things like the Orion Nebula. Globular clusters are all ancient and are among the oldest stars in the universe. And that comes from studying their HR diagrams and seeing systematically that globular clusters have very low turnoff points, whereas open clusters have a range of so yes. where, where the point, or how old the turnoff point is, is how old the cluster is, basically? The main sequence lifetime of stars at the turnoff point is how old the cluster is. So in other words, this cluster is 10 million years old, and stars right here on the main sequence, which spend 10 million years on the main sequence, are just now leaving the main sequence. Yeah, okay. And so forth. Stars right here on the main sequence spend 1 billion years on the main sequence, so a cluster which is one billion years old, those turnoff point stars will be at that position because that's exactly where stars that live for one billion years on the main sequence uh, live on the main are on the main sequence. So they're just now starting to turn off. So locating the turnoff point tells you how the cluster is. It's kind of like if you had a forest full of trees, and for some reason, real trees aren't like this. For some reason, the taller a tree was, the quicker it died. 
then you could look at a forest of trees. <laughs> uh, we'll probably be better. Orchard of trees that were all planted at the same time. And if you could find the tallest tree that's still alive, and you knew how long that tree lived, then you'd know how old the orchard was. It's kind of similar to that. How do you find mass from the eclipsing binary and the stars? So, uh, you need to know two things. So, we've got Kepler's third law, which tells us that, there we go, we have Kepler's third law, which is what I Kepler's third law tells us that the sum of the masses is equal to the cube of the size of their orbits added together, the semi-major axes added together, divided by the period squared, where the masses are in terms of the sun's mass, the semi-major axis in terms of AUs, and the period is in terms of Earth years. So we have a way to figure out the sum of the masses from our observations because the period comes from looking at how long it is between eclipses of the same type. And we get the semi-major axis sizes from doing the Doppler shift measurements and seeing how fast they're moving and using the fact that if it's a circular orbit, the radius is equal to the semi-major axis. So the circumference, 2 pi times the semi-major axis, is the orbital speed multiplied by the period how fast the star is moving times how long it takes to go once around. And then the other piece is that the ratio of the masses, m1 divided by m2, is equal to the flipped over ratio of their speeds, v2 divided by v1. And again, the Doppler shifts tell us how fast the two stars are moving. And if we know both the sum of the masses and the ratio of the masses, that's two equations and two unknowns, and you can solve for the individual masses in that case. So we have everything we need with eclipsing binaries because the fact that they're eclipsing tells us that we're looking nearly in the plane of the orbit. Uh, so that tells us that the maximum Doppler shift corresponds to the stars moving straight towards us and straight away from us, and it's giving us the speed directly. So we can figure out what V is from that, and then we can figure out what the orbital period is from looking at how long it is between primary eclipses, for example. One primary eclipse to the next is one orbital period. Is that do it for you? Or do you want to use yeah, that? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. okay. any, any additional questions about that? Okay. Yes, uh -huh. so you, I probably missed it well when I was typing. So A is what? The semi-major axis. Semi-major semi axis, yeah. So. Period is the same for both stars, so really there's two relations here. In other words, the Doppler shift for star 1 tells me how fast it's moving. So 2 pi a1 is v1 times the period. And for the other star, its Doppler shift tells me how fast it's moving. So 2 pi a2 is v2 times the period. Are those all the same units? Uh, we can put them all, yeah, we want to put them all in the same units ultimately. So one can do it in terms of kilograms and meters and years by having a 4 pi squared over g in front of all of this stuff. Um, or if there's a 4 pi squared over g somewhere, I can figure out where. But in the end, it's most convenient to put things in terms of a use years and astronomical units, and then and masses of the sun, and then to say yeah, a use masses of the sun and, and years, because then the 4 pi squared over g becomes one, and you just get this. Sadly, though, we didn't do any examples of that calculation. Maybe I will next time. But, but I want you to understand qualitatively the idea that with the, with the eclipsing binary, I have everything I need, all the ingredients I need to do the calculation. We don't do the detailed calculation. Because what you need is the orbital period and how fast the stars are moving. And that gives you everything. So um, the, we use the fact that there is a simple formula that
that the distance to the star in parsecs is 1 divided by the parallax in arc seconds. So once you've measured the parallax, half the angle by which the star shifts back and forth on the sky over the course of the year, once you've measured that and expressed it in arc seconds, plugging into this formula tells you the distance to the star. And it's just reflecting the fact that the further away the star is, the smaller it shifts back and forth. That's why it's a 1 over relationship like that. Yeah, I could say something like, you know, if a star's parallax is 0.1 arc seconds, how far away is it? Right? And that's, that's easy enough. 1 over 0.1 is 10 parsecs in that case. I assume you're going to write formulas on the board? Um, I will try to remember this time to print out the formula sheet. Last time I wrote them on the board just because right. I, I got, I was like, oh crap, I forgot to attach the formula sheet right. to the exam before I sent it to duplicate it. Well, one way or the other, you know. Mm -hmm. You can, and um, and then it will depend on, you know, 
say, would this take me an hour to explain, or would it take me, you know, three minutes to explain? And, and it'll be kind of based on that. Because, and, and, you know, I mean, obviously it wouldn't take me an hour to explain face to face, but there are some things where, you know, I'd have to refer to a picture, in which case it would become really elaborate. So just give it a try, you know. And most of the time, the answer is, yeah, I, I can explain it. But every once in a while, there would be something like, no, no, you really need to, like, you know, see me about this. It's just too long to try to explain without the picture or something. Bigger mass means more luminous on, on, the on the main sequence. And realize that the luminosity rises faster than the mass does, right? In other words, doubling the mass does more than double the luminosity, which is why more massive stars live less time, because increase, it, the, the luminosity increases by a much greater fast factor than the mass does. So the greater rate of burning the new the greater rate of burning their nuclear fuel more than makes up for their larger supply of nuclear fuel, and therefore more massive stars go through their fuel more quickly than less massive stars do. <laughs> you decide that. You have to read 200 pages for something else? Yeah. Oh. Well, that's a good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know. Conflict minor, so. Uh huh.